So now let's get started. So what you're going to see tonight and then going to see again later on YouTube, probably tomorrow or the next day, is a Messianic Seder. We call it Messianic because it's about Jesus. Because, you know, Jesus said of himself, all the scrolls are about me. He didn't say some of the scrolls. He didn't say part of this one and most of that one and a couple of words here. And he said, all the scrolls are about me. And, and many of you have taken the Torah class. Some of you have taken it twice. <laughs> some of you are taking it for the second time now. And so you know about the Passover, and you know that God commanded seven holy days, seven feasts of Israel, that the Messiah Jesus, we may call him Yeshua from time to time, because that's what his mother called him. And that's what his name is. And his name means salvation. So Yeshua has fulfilled six of the seven feasts already, the only one he hasn't fulfilled is Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. And when you read the Bible, when you read um, descriptions of what Jesus comes back, his coming is going to be announced by a trumpet blast, which for the most part, when the Bible talks about a trumpet blast, he's talking about a shofar. So when he comes back, it's going to be announced by a shofar blast. And then he will have fulfilled all seven feasts. But Passover is, of course, there's three spring feasts, four, um, four spring feasts, sorry. Passover, unleavened bread, which they kind of go together, first fruits, and Pentecost or Shavuot in Hebrew. We use the Greek word Pentecost, it's Shavuot in Hebrew. These are the spring feasts. And Passover, which we're celebrating now, Pesach in Hebrew, is so definitively describing Yeshua and what he does that you don't have to be a biblical scholar to pick up all the points. Because basically, Passover, the Jewish Passover, the Hebrew fat Passover, is a, is a freedom festival, right? It's freedom from slavery in Egypt. And you all remember the, Egypt, the Hebrews got there because of Joseph. Then there was a famine in the land. Then whole Jacob's family went to Egypt. And for a few years, they lived great there. But then they got enslaved because the pharaohs worried there were going to be more Hebrews and there were going to be Egyptians. And so they became slaves and made bricks for Pharaoh to build his pyramids and his cities. So the first Passover was God sovereignly rescuing his chosen people out of slavery, a physical slavery. And you got out if you killed a lamb, an unblemished, spotless lamb, and put the blood over the doorpost of your house. And you can see on your handout, the cover, the guy putting blood um, over the top of the house. We're going to get to that in a minute. But when you think about what happens at the cross, Jesus is the perfect lamb, the unblemished lamb, the perfect sacrifice. And if we apply his blood to us to have our sin forgiven, we're freed from slavery to sin. And so there, he fulfills that immediately. Lamb, blood, lamb, capital L, blood, capital B. Saved by the curse, saved from the curse. You know, it sounded pretty silly. If you would have been one of the Israelites and you were making bricks and somebody came and said, you know what? God told Moses, we're going to get a lamb. We're going to kill the lamb. We're going to put blood on the door. And then the angel of death is going to go over and we're going to be spared. And then we're leaving. You would have said, yeah, right. Sure. That sounds pretty weird. Does that sound like a logical plan? No. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, right in chapter 1, the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. You know, how many people say to you, are you kidding me? Do you mean some guy who was executed 2,000 years ago has something to do with me today? Come on. It doesn't make any sense. So the, the feast days are 
Passover is fulfilled by Yeshua on the day of the crucifixion. And actually, I say on the day because most of you know that the Hebrew day begins at sundown, does not begin at midnight, does not begin at sunrise. The Hebrew day begins at sundown, right? So when Jesus did the Last Supper, which was his last Passover Seder on earth in the flesh, sitting at a table with his disciples, it was already Friday in Hebrew terms. So the Seder, the garden, um, you know, the bringing before Pilate, the scourging, the suffering, the crucifixion, the death, the put in the tomb, all happens on the Hebrew Friday, which was Passover that year. So keep that in mind as we go. Because if Jesus had died in July, we'd still be saved from our sins, but why wouldn't God have kept everything kind of, you know, cons he kept everything very consistent. On the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he's in the tomb. On the Feast of First Fruits, he rises from the dead. Because Paul says he's the first fruits of the resurrection. And we're all going to rise all in our proper order. So we don't celebrate this because we're trying to be Jews. Right? We don't do this because... You know, we feel like, you know, we have to do it. We do this because we learn the depths of the plan of salvation. Because if you don't understand the Torah, if you don't understand law, you can't understand grace. You can't see what you're saved from. And so this is why we go through this. And getting back to the handout, this is called the Haggadah or Haggadah. It means the telling. It's the telling of the Passover story. The meal is called the Seder, which means order, because it's always done in the same order, the same particular script, if you will, which is basically this. Now, Yeshua's Last Supper, and for those of you, we have to inject a little bit of humor. Why is it, most of you probably know this, why is it that we all should learn a little bit of Hebrew? So when we get to heaven, we won't have culture shock. <laughs> so when Jesus tells you his name is Yeshua, you won't be surprised. <laughs> My little joke. This is a tough crowd. <laughs> but anyway, so we're going to read through this. We have a volunteer to be reader number one and a volunteer to be reader number two. And we're going to go through this. But everything starts with a candle lighting. The Sabbath starts Friday at sundown with the candle lighting. And if you ever come to one in Messiah Friday night in Parma, you'll see Joan light the candles. Not always at sundown because we start at 6.15. <laughs> in the summer, that's kind of tough. We'd have to start at 9.30. But um, the woman of the house always lights the candles. And in Jewish tradition, Eve brought darkness into the world. So the woman in the house lights the candles to bring light back into the world. And the Sabbath candles separate the Sabbath from the rest of the days. The Sabbath is a holy day every week. You know, there are seven feasts, but the Sabbath is holy every week. And God says in, in Exodus, you know, just, you have to keep the Sabbath, you have to keep the Sabbath, you have to keep the Sabbath. Every time you turn the page, he's saying, you have to keep the Sabbath very important day so it's separated the feast days are separated so in order to start this meal the woman's going to light the candles so we're going to start reading there at the first page the woman of the house says traditional blessing as she lights the candles and she's going to do that Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has set apart by your commandments and commanded us to light the festival lights. Amen. Amen. 
Oh, I forgot. <laughs> you want to do that again? Um, I'll say one more thing about the Hebrews as we go on. Jews are very much like Catholics. Hope nobody will be offended. They add a lot of traditions to things as time goes on. Nowhere in the Bible does it command you to light festival lights or Seder li or Sabbath lights, but these got to be customs. So sometimes you'll hear the Lord commanding. Like, we'll talk about the, the talit later. Men are commanded to wear the prayer shawl every day from sunrise to sundown. So Yeshua would have never left the house without his prayer shawl on. He would have been violating God's law. And we'll get to that later, kind of a show and tell. You don't do the Seder with a prayer shawl on. You use a white vestment looking thing. But I'm not going to do that because... First of all, I don't have one, and second of all, I look ridiculous at it. <laughs> How fitting it is that the mother in the home brings light to our Passover, for it was through the woman that the one who is light came into the world. Reader one. Together, let us all say the messianic blessing, which centers our thoughts on Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us in Yeshua, the Messiah, the light of the world. Now, at this point, you do a blessing over the children, but I don't think we have anybody here who qualifies as a child. <laughs> that would be kids less than 13. A boy becomes a man when he's 13. With girls, it's a little less defined. But needless to say, we don't have any children here. But a father blesses children with this, this blessing when they go to bed and on holy days. Now, of course, in a traditional Jewish home, they're not going to talk about Peter and Andrew. And they're not going to talk about Mary, like it says in the Messianic blessing. <clears throat> now, in a traditional Seder, there's four cups of wine. The night of the Last Supper, they only drank three. We're going to talk about that later. Jesus cut it off at the third cup, which interestingly was the cup he consecrated as his blood, the blood of the new covenant, and it's called the cup of redemption. Isn't that cool? So every Jew in the world says the third cup is the cup of redemption. And that's the one that Jesus consecrated and said, this is my blood. So how cool is that? But the first cup is the Kiddush. The Kiddush is the first cup of wine tonight. It means sanctification. It reminds us that we are set apart by God for service. Let us remember that as believers in Yeshua, we're set apart from the world. Let us reflect on the spotless Lamb of God. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. You have provided us, O Lord, with seasons for rejoicing, like this Passover, to remember the exodus from Egypt and the redemption of our ancestors from slavery. You have chosen us and given us a greater redemption by delivering us from the slavery to sin through the Lamb of God, our Messiah. Oh, I failed to say, pour the first cup. <laughs> now, also in Hebrew, a little different than in Christian circles, because in Hebrew, the wine is always blessed before the bread. Wine is blessed first and then the bread. So the blessing over the wine will sound very familiar to all of you because the blessing over the wine is, a blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe who creates the fruit of the vine. Or in Hebrew, it's Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Malech HaOlam Borei Pri Hagafen. Now you can drink the first cup. Now, at this point, there's a hand washing that we're going to skip. There's actually two hand washings. Most people feel that Jesus used the second one to do, to do the washing of the feet. Some people think it was the first one. 
which actually, as Joan pointed out yesterday, kind of makes more sense. But um, Jews always wash their hands before they eat, and it's always in, with running water. Very, very uh, picky about that. And so it may have been at this point that instead of just washing their hands, he put the stuff around them and washed their feet. Now, here we are doing this, and we don't generally do this. We're just doing this as kind of a commemoration. Those disciples that were there that night, they had been to a lot of seders in their life. This is the first time they noticed something was going to be different about this seder. Because instead of pouring water over their hands, Jesus gets up and he washes their feet. Now, in that desert climate, people wore sandals. When you went to somebody's house, when you went to visit whatever you were doing, your feet were disgusting. You took your sandals off, and the lowest servant in the place washed your feet. We did that when we did our many, many, many mission trips in Mexico City. We always did a foot washing with the little kids in the garbage areas because their feet were so disgusting and their shoes and socks were so disgusting that we would take soapy water and wash their feet and give them new shoes and socks. And and when you live in a garbage dump, let me tell you, you get new shoes and socks, whew, you think you're like on top of the world. You're on top of the world. So this is the first point where he deviates from the normal Seder. And they probably all said to themselves, what is he doing? Well, we know what Peter said. He goes, yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> you're, you're not going to wash my feet. And, you know, he, he, when I want to get go off on another tangent, but, you know, he talks about if you're, if you're, if you're washed, you're clean, but not all of you are clean because, of course, Judas was there. Just your feet have to be washed because we can be clean spiritually, but then we walk around in a dirty, disgusting world and our feet get dirty. And he has to wash our feet periodically. We have to let him wash our feet periodically. So that's the washing. Now, in the front here at this table, there's what's called a Seder plate. I know you can't see it from there, but you can come up and look at it later. There are six items that help to tell the story of the Passover. There's a carpus, or what are called greens, which is represented here by parsley. <laughs> you know, green's the color of spring, the color of growing things. It's the color of, of new life. And it also commemorates the hyssop. When they put the blood on the doorposts of their house, they had to use a hyssop, which is some kind of plant that looks kind of like a cattail or something, okay? Where else do we hear it? Where else do we see hyssop being used in the scriptures? Crucifixion. Yes, the crucifixion. When they raised the sponge with sour wine to him, they did it with a hyssop. So even that was used by God to, to commemorate the freedom event, right down to the hyssop being used. Um, then you're also going to find a little container of salt water. This little teeny thing it's got salt water in it. And that, of course, represents tears. It represents the tears that our ancestors shed when they were slaves in Egypt. As we dip the carpus, the green, into the salt water, we remember that a life without redemption is filled with tears and sorrow. Now, where it says all, let us be grateful that we are redeemed by Yeshua and that while tears will come in this life, we have a promise of an eternity free of tears and sorrow. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the earth. So now you take a little sprig of parsley and you dip it in the salt water and you eat it.
Now, reader number one, you have to read really loud. <clears throat> um, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I turned over two pages. Okay, never mind. Rewind. <laughs> this is the coolest part. This is my favorite part. I want you to play, pay really close attention. This is a pouch that is always very decorative and is usually made out of silk. This one isn't. This is called a matzatash. Inside the matzatash, there are three three compartments. You can come up and, and look at this later. But there are three compartments inside the matzatash. And what happens at this point is the leader puts a board of matzah in each of the compartments. Three compartments, three pieces of bread. The Jews call this the unity. Three and one. One by three. Everybody still awake? So it's called the unity. Ed's got it. It's called the unity. They explain it as meaning the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They have all kinds of different explanations. But the word unity is interesting because in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, there's the Shema, which separates the Israelites from all the other people who lived on earth at that time, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They were the only monotheistic people in the world at this time. The Egyptians had hundreds of gods. All the people around them had hundreds and thousands of gods. They said, there's one God. In Hebrew, Shema means listen, but it doesn't just mean to hear a sound. It means listen and understand. Hero, hero Israel, Shema Israel, Adonai, the Lord, Eloheinu, our God, Adonai Echad, Lord is one. And the word Echad, which is used for the word one, means one but has parts to it, like a bunch of grapes. You say that's not one bunch of grapes, but it has different parts. Not that God has parts, but we know what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> There's three persons in the Godhead. They did not appreciate that, although God gives all kinds of hints through the Torah, through the whole Old Testament about this. But there's three. <clears throat> so for all believers in Yeshua, this represents the mystery of the Trinity. One yet three, three yet one. Now, here's the cool part. The leader takes, and Jesus was the leader at the Last Supper. There was one person who runs the Seder. It's not a democracy. It's not a committee of people. There's one person who runs it, and it's, of course, usually the father of the house. Now, you know, if you have a grandfather who's there, you know, the oldest man, but a man does it, and one person does it. So the leader takes the middle matzah, the second piece, the second piece of the unity, and breaks it. puts half of it back into the matzatash. Now remember, this is a Jewish tradition. They don't realize what they're doing. Then there's another bag called an afikoman. This, is, this one's kind of silky, but they're generally made out, of, made out of linen. What else is made out of linen? Burial shrouds. 
and the afikoman is opened up, the broken part is put into it, and it's sealed up. Now, in ancient times, obviously, they didn't have zippers, but they sealed it up somehow. So the middle part, which is broken, is put into a burial shroud. And then this is taken and hidden. This is a children's game. This is for the children. It's taken and hidden. And later on, one of the children is going to find it and bring it back to the table. So it's going to go away for a while. And then it's going to come back. Woo, anybody blown away yet? So, goes away on Friday, comes back Sunday morning, goes away at the Ascension, comes back, I hope tonight, but pretty soon, maybe tomorrow. Goes away for a while, and then he comes back. I'm not going to hide it. I'm just going to put it over here. I'll probably find it. So, then it goes on from there, and the middle broken piece is gone. Not here with us, seemingly. Is that cool or what? Now, we're going to get later what's totally mind-blowing about this as a children's game. Now, the other thing, when you look at a matzah, if you hold it up to the light, what do you see? Holes. It's pierced. And what else do you see? Stripes. Isaiah 53. By his stripes were healed. All our iniquities were put on him. So he's pierced and covered with stripes. It ends up looking this way, of course, because the scripture tells us they had they couldn't wait for the dough to rise, and they just had to bake it like this. So the grid, the grid, whatever you call it, the gridiron makes the marks. And, you know, as it cooks, it makes little holes because it bubbles up. But even this represents the Messiah. Is that awesome or what? <clears throat> and when, when a piece is held up, the leader says, this is the bread of affliction. Now, he's talking about this is the bread we ate when we were still slaves, but we were on our way out. This is Jesus, th that prefigured Jesus, who went through the most horrible affliction that no one can imagine. No one can imagine. We just watched The Passion of the Christ last week at our Bible study here. And no matter how many times you see it, everybody's speechless. Would you say everybody was speechless? Don't hear any sounds because... So all this prefigures what happens. It's the bread of affliction. Jesus took on willingly the affliction. You know, Paul says he did that for the glory set before him. So that we can be with him in his glory. You know, Paul in Romans 8 tells us, and in Galatians 4 tells us, we're adopted sons and daughters of God because of what Jesus did. So he's willing to be the bread of affliction so that we can be with him. Whew, I know I'm getting off the script. I start preaching and then that's it. <clears throat> Let's go down... Um, pretty much covered this. We were slaves and now we're free. Um, now you fill the second cup with wine. You pour the second cup, I should say. But don't drink it yet. The second cup is called the cup of plagues. <clears throat> so now the youngest person at this point asks the famous four questions. We're not going to 
put any pressure on who I think might be the youngest person here, but. <laughs> <clears throat> so these are all kind of prefaced by why is this night different than all other nights? Why on this night do we only eat matzah? On any other night we can eat regular bread or matzah. Why on this night do we eat bitter herbs? Why on this night do we dip twice? Why on this night do we only recline at tables, at table? And now they tell the story of the Exodus, which is what Agatha means. So now we got reader one, real loud. Jacob and his family lived. The sons of Jacob traveled to Egypt to purchase food. Joseph, the favorite son of Jacob, who had been hated by his brothers years earlier and sold into slavery, was not abandoned by God. He not only forgave his brothers for their treachery, but because of the favor and influence he had with the Pharaoh, his whole family was welcomed to live in the land of Egypt and was provided for during the times of famine. And so the land settled in Those who were obedient to 
his word. That is where we get the name of the beast. Pesach or Passover. All right. So the nine you, you remember the first nine plagues didn't affect the Israelites. Remember? In Goshen everything was great. But the tenth plague, they had to have this or else the plague would have also affected them. And it's the firstborn of people and animals. So if you had a pet cat that was the firstborn of the litter, it died. If you were the firstborn of your parents, you died. The firstborn of your kids that were living in the house died. So it says, you know, if you remember when we read Exodus, it says the Israelites could hear the wailing and the crying of the Egyptians. Can you imagine? Because it was in every house. Every family was affected. And later we're going to see that God says to the Israelites, your firstborn are consecrated to me. So the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed. The firstborn of the Israelites were consecrated to him. In Jewish tradition, a full cup is a symbol of complete joy. That's where David says, my cup runneth over. You know, when you pour a liquid into a cup and sometimes it goes a little bit over the, the top and then it starts to leak out. Well, that's full joy. We do not rejoice that our enemies had to suffer plagues and die in order for us to be set free. So we make the cup less full by removing a drop of wine from our cups for each of the 10 plagues as we recite them. So what you do is you put your finger in the, I mean, if you want to do this, you put your finger in the wine and you shake it down on, on your plate as you say the names of each of the plagues. So we have blood, frogs, lice, wild beasts, disease, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, slaying of the firstborn. The Lord has been generous to overflowing in all he has done for us. And any of his many saving acts would be enough to shout out our thanks and offer praise. So then this goes into a song called The Day A New. This is sung, but we're not going to sing it. Because number one, I only sing if the room needs to be evacuated. <clears throat> so we're just going to recite it. You see, Unfortunately, these pages aren't numbered. If he had only taken us out of Egypt and judged the Egyptians, they knew it would have been enough. If he had judged their gods but not slain their firstborn, they knew it would have been enough. If he had divided the Red Sea but not allowed us to pass through on dry land, if he allowed us to pass but did not drown the Egyptian army. If he had brought us into the wilderness, but not fed us with manna. If he had fed us with the manna, but had not given us the Sabbath. If he had given us the Sabbath, but not the Torah. If he had given us the Torah, but not led us into Israel. If he had led us into Israel, but not built and consecrated the temple, as followers of Yeshua, we had still another day anew. Our God not only provided all the above, he provided a once for all atonement for us through Yeshua the Messiah, who died for our sins and rose from the dead so that we can have abundant life. <clears throat> in order to tell the whole Passover story, there are three important things, Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, the Passover lamb, the unleavened bread, and the bitter herbs. Those are the only things that are required when you read the account of the Passover in Exodus. You have to have those things. Now, 
The Jews have not had lamb for a long time because since the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, they don't make lamb. So they'll have the other stuff. The temple being destroyed, and you know, you've heard me say this a million times. If somebody destroys this church, well, we can go to church over there. And if somebody destroys this church and that church, we're going to find a church over there. If somebody destroys every church in greater Cleveland, we can meet somewhere in a field, right, and worship. We can have communion. We can, we can be. But when the temple is destroyed, everything stops. You can't do sacrifices. There's no atonement for sin. That can only be done in the temple. So since 70 AD, there's been no blood atonement for sin. Kind of scary when you think about it. So the rabbis had to, had to like, you know, do a bunch of thinking about what to tell people. <laughs> and what they decided is, well, if you do good things, that's the same as the blood sacrifice. But, you know, the scripture says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. But anyway, <clears throat> reader two. Yeshua was God's perfect lamb, sacrificed for us. As our ancestors applied the blood of the Passover lamb to the doorposts of their homes, sparing the lives of the firstborn, today we apply the blood of Yeshua to the doorposts of our hearts. Our sins are then forgiven and we are set free to serve the living God. <laughs> In every generation, we are to see ourselves as though we personally came out of slavery in Egypt, for God has redeemed us also. Before we go on, this is a very important point. When you tell the Passover story, you have to tell it in the first person. You say, I, we. You don't say those people, our ancestors, you know, those. You say, I, when I came out, when we came out of Egypt, when we were slaves in Egypt. And God commands them to do this, to tell the story in the first person. It's not a tradition. He tells them to do it. Now, why do you think, you can think about this for a minute. Why do you think he did that? Why does he want you to say, I came out of Egypt and I was a slave and I was, think about that. So now we raise the second cup. We don't drink it yet. We praise you, O Lord, for bringing us from bondage to freedom, from despair to hope, from darkness to your great light. Now you put it down. Don't be too hasty to drink it. <laughs> now we go to the what are called the Hallel Psalms. It's 113. We start with 113 to 115. The Hallel Psalms are 113 to 118. Trivia question, why are we glad it stops at 118? Because 119, 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Don't try to memorize the whole chapter. <laughs> 117 is the shortest chapter in the whole Bible. So at this point, we read 113 to 115. 
Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the place where it goes down, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts them up from the ash heaps. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. You mountains that you skipped like rams, you hills like lambs. Who turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. Why do the nations say, where is their God? But their idols are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. May the Lord make you increase, both you and your children. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Now again, you're going to raise your second cup. We bless you, O Lord, our King and Redeemer. We praise you, O Lord, for not only redeeming our ancestors from slavery in Egypt, but for sending the ultimate deliverer in Yeshua, who frees us from sin and death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Now you drink it. Now there's another hand washing. See, this handout tells you this is where Jesus washed the feet. But <clears throat> he washes the feet, either the first one or this one. The Lord set this example for us to serve one another when he said, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. We now wash our hands. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to wash our hands. Now, there's a blessing over the matzah. Now, remember, the afikoman is still hidden. Now, we've already had two blessings of wine. This is the first blessing that comes of bread. This is not when the, the first consecration of the, of the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, occurred. It's going to be a little bit later. But now there's a blessing over the matzah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments 
and commanded us to eat the unleavened bread. Now, the blessing that Jesus would have said at this point, and he would have said the blessing because he was the leader, and that blessing is Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Malech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Bin Haaretz, which you are very familiar with. It's bread that comes from the earth. We thank God because he gives us bread from the earth. Can you imagine being an ancient person and planting, you know, wheat seeds, and then all of a sudden, after a few months, you have wheat, and you make the bread from it. It's like the bread comes out of the earth. I mean, what a blessing. We're kind of removed from that, but same idea. Now, the bitter herbs. We will now eat of the maror. Its bitter taste reminds us of the bitterness of slavery. The rabbis say we should eat at least a tablespoon to truly feel the bitterness. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and commanded us to eat the bitter herbs. So you can, that's the horseradish. This is a little different horseradish, but it's, so you dip a matzah in it and eat it. Or if you want to eat it plain, that's okay too. <laughs> I like horseradish and matzo. It's a breakfast of champions. <laughs> this is a tough audience. Lynn's the only one who laughed. <laughs> now we dip the matzo into the haroset, which is a sweet mixture, but it symbolizes the mortar that went into building the storage cities for Pharaoh. The reason it is sweet is that God wants us to remember even the bitterness of our labors can be sweet when we know his redemption draws near. So now you take the matzah, you take a piece of matzah and you dip it into the haroset. Now, if you remember in the Last Supper account, Jesus says, you know, one of you is gonna betray me. Remember that? And they all start saying, oh, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Who's it going to be? And then he says, the one who dips into the dish with me. So it's either when they were dipping the matzah into the bitter herb, most likely, or when they were dipping the matzah into the haroset, Judas's hand went in with his. And he foretold that the one who dips with me is going to be the one. Now is actually when you eat the meal. <laughs> but I think this is better because if you remember a lot of those satyrs at our house, after the meal, everybody thought it was over. So they'd get up and start walking out. <laughs> so we'll pretend now we're eating the meal. Now at this point, you pour the third cup of wine. Now, just as an aside, with, you know, the, um, the account of the, what we call the agony in the garden. If you, um, if you look on my YouTube site, you can see a teaching I did on it not too long ago. You know, there's this thing about, or on the podcast, I mean, I, I don't remember which is which. But, you know, Jesus goes back and these guys are asleep. You know, can't you stay awake with me for an hour? Well, we can't do it either. We can't stay awake with them for 10 minutes. Because, you know, we're busy with all kind of stuff. Then he finds them again. Oh, I know the spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. But when you think about it, these guys ate a really big dinner. Had three full cups of wine. They walked about two miles. By that time, it was probably like 11 p.m. 
I mean, they walked quite a ways. They get to the garden, and you know what I'd be doing? I'm just going to, like, sit here for a while. And Jesus says, I'm going to go over there and pray. And you can picture those guys saying, okay, you go over there and pray. We're just going to kind of rest here for a little bit. <clears throat> so now we get to what I think is so cool. The afikoman, which means that which comes after. Okay? It comes after the meal. The Seder is not complete without the apikoman. It's a children's game. Keep that in mind. There's no account in the Exodus about having an apikoman. There's no account in the Exodus about have games for the kids. There's no account in the Exodus about, you know, what time to send the kids to bed. It's because, <laughs> you know, a Seder in a Jewish home can go on for hours. I mean, we're just hitting the highlights. Afikoman means that which comes later or that which makes things complete. That which makes things complete. We cannot complete the Seder without it. The Afikoman was the bread that Yeshua gave his disciples after the Passover meal. He told them to take and eat for it was his body which would be broken for them. This bread is Messiah's gift to us. He promised that whoever comes to him will never go hungry, and whoever believes in him will never be thirsty. So at this point, and I know all of you are very familiar with this, he says a blessing over the bread again. Bless are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth blood or bread from the earth. Then, he says, take and eat of this, for this is my body. Well, I forgot to mention that, you know, one of the kids goes and looks for the afikoman and, and brings it back. So at the Last Supper, we know John was pretty young. We don't know if there were any children there. Probably not, but maybe. Whoever the youngest person was went and brought burial shroud, second piece of the matzah that was broken, back to him. And talk about changing everything these guys had ever heard at a Seder meal before. You know, Peter was older. He had been through quite a few Seders. He never heard anybody at a Seder say, take a knee to this because this is my body. Sometimes I think, I wonder what went, what went through their minds as they were sitting there. What? What did he, what did he say? What? That would be unbelievable for somebody to say that. I mean, it would be like us going to a dinner at somebody's house and having them say, well, this is my body. You'd say, he's finally lost his mind. So he takes the bread from a children's game and he blesses it, he consecrates it, he breaks it, and he passes it around. Everybody eats from this matzah. Not from the other ones that came before, because the ones that came before, everybody had their own matzah. Now he takes this one, breaks it up into pieces, and passes it around. It says, it's my body. And after the afikoman, nothing else is eaten. In similar matter, manner, when the supper was done, we get to the third cup of wine. Okay, now you can, oh, we already have the, we already have it filled. <laughs> the third cup is called the cup of redemption. Now, how awesomely amazing is that? Or is it amazingly awesome? How amazingly awesome is that? The cup of redemption. He says the blessing over it, the blessing of the wine again. And he says, this is the blood of the new covenant. And it's the new and eternal covenant. There's not going to be a third covenant ever. Right? 
There's not going to be a third testament. There's not going to be some other plan of salvation where God's going to say, well, up to 2038, we're going to keep the salvation with Jesus. But then after that, there's going to be a new plan. No, he says it's the eternal covenant. If you remember, well, y'all remember, when Moses read the law to the people, and they said, whatever the Lord says, we'll do. Well, that lasts for about a page. Yeah. Lasts for about 17 and a half minutes. <laughs> and then there's some other rebellion that goes on. I mean, could you believe all these rebellions? Like, we went through how many rebellions last Sunday night? Like, four of them in no time. <laughs> but there's rebellion after rebellion. But at the base of the mountain, whatever the Lord said, we're going to do. So Moses makes an altar with 12 pillars, one for each of the tribes, does a sacrifice, and he sprinkles blood on all the people. and says, this is the blood of the covenant. This is the blood of the covenant. Yeshua, Jesus, takes a cup of wine and says, this is the blood of the covenant. Not the, most, not the, most, not the law covenant. This is the covenant of grace. This is the blood that's going to be shed for you so that sins can be forgiven. First covenant, sealed with blood. Second covenant, sealed with blood with a capital B. Remember the writer? To, I don't know, we've studied Hebrews a million times in the, one, both of these groups. But, you know, the writer says, the blood of bulls and goats doesn't have any power to take away sin. It's a symbol. His blood has infinite power to take away sin. And what do I always say? Hitler could have been saved at the end had he repented. So the new covenant, you know, Jeremiah 31, 31 starts with, this, I'm going to make a new covenant. The writer to the Hebrews says, the first covenant couldn't save people. Not because the law was evil. The problem was people couldn't keep the law. So the third cup is the cup of redemption. Then he says, do this in memory of me. So he seals the covenant. He doesn't say, okay, that's it. He says, you're going to keep doing this. So here it is, 2,000 years later, more or less, and we're still doing it. <laughs> How cool is that? We're still doing it. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Then you drink the third cup. Now, Jesus has changed the Seder by washing feet instead of hands, by taking the afikoman and saying, this is my body, by taking the third cup, the cup of redemption, and saying, this is my blood of the new covenant. Then if you notice in the, in the Last Supper accounts, at this point it stops. It says they sang the songs and then they went to the garden. They didn't do the fourth cup. Traditional Jews do four cups. And the fourth cup, you know, is the cup of um, praise. And that's where you invite Elijah to come, and you tell the little kid to go see if Elijah's coming. And I don't think so. Of course, who knows? <clears throat> now, you notice in the Exodus, it doesn't say, leave a cup for Elijah. Elijah wasn't going to be born for... 500 more years or more, out of maybe more, 1,000 more years. But anyway, so at this point, they said the prayers and they sang the psalms. So they do the rest of the Hallel psalms. So see where it says grace after meal. Oh, we thank you, O oh Lord, for providing this food we have eaten. We thank you, O oh Lord, as well, for providing the bread of life and the cup of redemption which nourishes our soul. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, who provides for the whole world in your goodness. It is you who provides for all, sustains all, and is all sufficient for the needs of your creation. Thank you for your 
Blessed be our God, whose gifts we have enjoyed, and by whose goodness we live. Oh, we continue in praise to our God by reciting the remainder of the Hallel Psalms. Yeshua and his disciples would have sung them at this point. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. The cords of death entangle me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. That I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And in my dismay, I said, all men are liars. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call upon the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. O oh Lord, save us. O oh Lord, grant us success. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession to the horns of the altar. Uh, 
So at this point, they got up and they went to the garden. Now, say one before I go back over a couple things, and then we're then we're done. Whew. We did this at record speed. Um, there's debate about the fourth cup. Why was there not a fourth cup? Some people say, well, when they raised the sour wine to Jesus and he took it off the sponge and then he didn't want it and he said it is finished. Some people say that was the fourth cup because he knew that was going to happen. But he also said, I won't drink the fruit of the vine again until I drink it new in my father's kingdom. So maybe he's waiting for us to all get to heaven and then he's going to drink the fourth cup along with us. Woo. Anyway, I thought that was cute. Anyway, now, look at these psalms. You know, a lot of people don't think of David as a prophet, right? He's not counted as a prophet, right? Nobody says David the prophet. But look at this. Um, <laughs> the cords of death entangle me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Can you imagine as Jesus is reciting this, what he's thinking? I mean, the agony in the garden is going to be in about, you know, an hour or two. The scourging is going to be a few hours. His death's going to be maybe 14, 15 hours. And he's reading, the cords of death entangle me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. And I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, save me. Eloi, Eloi, Anisabakdani. Come and save me. Why have you forsaken me? Um, <laughs> I'm greatly afflicted. I will. How do I repay the Lord? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. We do that every Sunday, right? Lift up the cup of salvation, call upon the name of the Lord. Um, I am your servant, the son of your handmaid. But he's freed us from our sin. And look, it, it, it keeps talking about how um, the Lord has become our salvation. He has become our salvation. Remember, the Old Testament is a covenant of law, right? Whether you're righteous or not depends on how well you do with the law. If you violate one, same as violating them all. So there's only 613, but if you violate one, you might as well do the other 612, do it's the same. Oof, that's not good news. But here in the Psalm, it says, God has become my salvation. Jesus becomes our salvation, and he's the God-man. There's such awesome prophecies of this, I can't even stand it. <clears throat> and open the gates of righteousness that I can enter. So, of course, if you go through the whole Old Testament, you find this all through, because all the scrolls are about him. So, this is the Seder. This is the Passover. This is salvation from slavery in Egypt. And it's also salvation from sin. It's also redemption. It's also all these things that are written in the book of Exodus, all the traditions that were added, all being used by Yeshua Jesus at the Last Supper to say, this is the new covenant now. The new covenant is way more fun than the old covenant. <laughs> I mean, that's why it's called that's why the gospel's called good news. So I hope you've gotten some out of this. And I hope like the connections are I might have missed some of them because I do it too many times. But if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. If you want to know about the prayer shawl, I'll be happy to answer that because it's also kind of a, of a cool thing. <laughs>